You can't be successful by yourself. And with that in mind, let's talk about a few ways to build relationships. Most of these tips are for building business relationships, building contacts, building good working relationships with colleagues, with vendors, with prospects, with future clients and present clients and past clients. Building relationships. But remember, we are all people, regardless of our profession. And many of these tips work well for building other relationships, too. Let's start with kindness. How kind should you be? As kind as you possibly can. Who should you be kind to? To everyone you come in contact with. From taxi drivers to hotel clerks to waitresses to store clerks to people on the street and people in your office and people at home. Be kind to everyone. And here's why. A kind word goes a long way. Somebody's having a bad day and you don't know they're having a bad day. But somebody's really feeling bad and you offer up a kind word. Maybe it's just a friendly, hello, how are you? Maybe it's just taking a minute or two to listen to what somebody has to say. But your few words of kindness or your few minutes of attention could turn somebody's day around, might make them feel more worthwhile, cared for. Be generous with your kindness. It'll go a long way. People will remember, whether you know them or not. If you're in a crowded restaurant and you're especially nice to the waiter, guess what? He'll remember you next time you come in. And then guess what'll happen? You'll get even better service. When you give kindness, it's not gone. It's invested. It'll come back to you two, five, ten, a hundred times. Kindness, it's so important in every aspect of your life. It's so important in building good relationships with others. Now here's what else is important. Sensitivity. Being touched by the experiences of others being sensitive to others, understanding the plight of others, opening up your heart and your mind and your attention to address the needs of others, the people you work with, the people you live with, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing if you can what's going on in their heart. If there's a problem, you've got to be sensitive enough to ask some questions. Not one question, but many questions. Sometimes you won't even get through to the root of the problem until you've gotten two or three questions deep. Most people won't reveal the problem on the first question. You say, Mary, how are you today? How are things? And she says, well, everything's okay. And you can tell by the way she said it that everything's not okay. And most of us don't want to come right out and say what the real problem is unless two criteria are met. Number one, we're talking to someone we can trust. And number two, we're talking to someone who really cares. So sometimes it takes that second question, maybe a third and maybe a fourth, before trust builds. And the person finally understands that you do care. Then they're willing to tell you what's really going on, what's really on their mind. Gosh, that saves so much time asking questions up front did you ever talk for an hour and then ask a question, found out that you just wasted the previous hour? Learn to ask questions that will build the trust and communication between you and those you work with. Learn to express, not impress. If you want to touch somebody, express sincerity from the heart. Impress builds a gulf. Express builds a bridge. Identification. You want to be able to relate your thoughts and philosophies and experiences to someone who'll say, Me too. I know what you mean. You don't want their reaction to be, So what? If you're meeting someone for the first time, you're simply getting acquainted, making contact. Here's where you start. Find something you have in common. Find something you can both identify with. Start with where they are before you try taking them where you want them to go. So if you're trying to talk to somebody who's been stricken in the heart 
and you've had this experience, you can talk about being stricken in the heart, and it'll mean something. It'll have substance, it'll have depth. And if you start there, and then start building the bridge, you have identification. Then you start building rapport. And when you start building a rapport with someone, or when you want to enhance the rapport you have with someone, you need effective communication skills. You'll need the skills that'll help you work better with others to achieve their goals and achieve your goals. You need effective communication skills. Let me give you a few tips on good communication. Because to be able to get along well with others, to be able to work well with others, to be able to live well with others, you must be a good communicator. Number one, have something worth saying. Interest, fascination, sensitivity, and knowledge. Number two, now that you've got something worth saying, number two is say it well. And you've got to be able to translate it so it'll benefit someone. You must have a good delivery system for your substance and knowledge and awareness and understanding and experience. Learn to say it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. The best communication occurs when both people are sincere, one sincerely wishing to learn or listen, and the other sincerely wishing to share. Number two in saying it well is repetition. Part of saying it well is simply practicing to say it well. Practice, practice, practice. Part of what I teach in sales training is practice. Practice. You start with something simple. And when you don't know much about what you're doing, practice is even more important. Let's say you're in sales and your presentation's not that good. And you wander around saying, you wouldn't want to buy this, would you? I'm telling you, maybe if you say that often enough during the day, somebody might say, well, maybe I would. What are you selling? Now you can't say, mind your own business. No, once you've opened the door, you've got to go through it. Here's what happens if you practice in sales. You're bound to make sales. Somebody will say, what are you selling? And you've got to tell them, maybe they'll want it. You're bound to get better. If you practice, you'll get better. You'll get better at your sales presentation. You'll get better at listening to your prospect. You'll get better at closing the sale. You'll get better at earning a living. Practice is just as valuable as a sale. Because here's what's valuable in sales, the skills. The sale will make you a living. The skills will make you a fortune. So practice your presentation and your ability to communicate what you know. The people out there who say, no, I wouldn't care for any, are just as valuable. Why? Because they took the time to let you practice your presentation. And especially when you're just getting started, you might want to pay them to listen to you practice while you stumble around. So, be thankful for the no's. Practice helps you develop skills. Skills make labor more valuable. If you just sell, you can make a living. If you skillfully sell, you can make a fortune. If you just talk, you can hold a family together. If you skillfully talk, you can build dreams and the future. The difference is skill. You can cut a tree down with a hammer, but it takes about 30 days. If you trade the hammer for an ax, you can cut the tree down in about 30 minutes. The difference between the 30 minutes and 30 days is the tool. And your best communication tool is your skill. So practice to get the skill of saying it well. Part of saying it well is sincerity. The next part is repetition. Now here's another part of saying it well. Brevity. Sometimes you don't need too much, just enough. The more you know, here's what I found out. The more you know, the briefer you can be because you can learn to make words more effective. Jesus was brief when he was putting his team together. 
He just wandered around the countryside, and every once in a while he'd see somebody he wanted on his team and said, You follow me. Now that's short. That's brief. Now why could Jesus be so brief and yet be so effective? Here's what I think. For all that he was that he didn't have to say. For all that he was that he didn't have to say. When you become bigger, when you become wiser, when you become stronger, you become a person of better reputation. So that when you arrive, maybe your reputation has preceded you. And when you get there, you don't have to say much. You don't have to launch into a two-hour harangue if your reputation has preceded you. Your reputation will get a lot of the job done for you before you ever arrive. Next is style. Part of saying it well is style. Be a student of style, a variety of styles. Then make sure you develop your own. Be a student, but develop your own. Don't be someone else. Let someone else influence you, but don't become them. Develop your own style. Here's another tip on saying it well. Vocabulary. You've just got to have a good vocabulary to say it well. Vocabulary. We can only translate for other people with the tools called vocabulary. If you're lacking in vocabulary, then you're lacking in tools to describe some problem or some answer. Words, vocabulary, you can't communicate without them. And you can't communicate well without a defined vocabulary. Every time you come across a word that's new to you, what should you do? Look it up. Every time you're in a conversation and the other person uses a word that's new to you, look it up. Now, most of the time you can figure out the meaning of a new word by how it's used. But if you can't, Make sure you hold your response until you know for sure. Several years ago, some of my friends took a survey among prisoners, some rehabilitation program they were working on. And they weren't looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a relationship between vocabulary and behavior. Interesting. This is what they found. The more limited the vocabulary, the more the tendency to poor behavior. Wow. When you stop to think about it for a moment, it makes sense. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. It gives us insight. And only with your present vocabulary can you see. You can't use tools you don't have to see, to create light, understanding, awareness, comprehension, perception, vision. You can only have as much vision as your present vocabulary will give you. And if you're limited in vocabulary, then you can't see very well. What if a person could only see the world through a little tiny hole? Can you imagine the mistakes he'd make in judgment? He'd say, here's how it is. You'd say, no, that's not how it is. Here's how it is. The guy says, but I can't see it. How come he can't see it? He doesn't have the vocabulary to understand the translation. Now, vocabulary is also what we use as a tool to express what's going on in our heart, what's going on in our head. Translate our questions, translate our answers, our perceptions, what we see to be able to say it. And I'm telling you, if you have a limited way of translating and expressing what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your head, you'll fall way behind. So you'd have twin problems without a good vocabulary. Number one, you wouldn't be able to see. Number two, you wouldn't be able to express. And your world would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, not having the vision, not having the tools. Finally, you wouldn't need a place much bigger than 10 by 12 to live. Why? That's about as big as some people's world is. That's all they've got, this little narrow world. Making mistakes every day. Why? They can't see. Getting it wrong every day. They can't comprehend. They can't understand. No tools with which to translate. 
For good communication, number one is having something good to say. Number two is saying it well. And number three is reading your audience. You've got to read what's going on between you and the people you're talking to. Should you say what you're saying a little softer? Should you say it a little stronger? Should you explain it more? Should you be more clear and concise? Should you quit? A lot of the decision making that's going on during a conversation with someone depends on how well you can read, how well you can tell what's going on in the minds of those you're trying to reach. Doesn't matter if you're looking into the face of a child or the face of a colleague or a thousand faces in an audience. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to pay attention. So let me give you some ways to read. The first one is you've got to read what you see. You've got to read what you see. Search the face of a child and see if you're coming across. See if they look perplexed. See if they're getting it. See if they can't get it. Body language tells us a lot. Look at how the people you're talking to are sitting. What they are doing with their hands, their eyes. A guy's got his arms crossed, legs crossed, chin tucked down and frowning. You've got your work cut out for you. This guy's not going to be easy to reach. The lady's standing up from behind her desk. You've got to hurry. She's not going to listen to much more. You've probably got to pick up the pace and get down to it. So the first one is read what you see. Here's the second one: read what you hear. You've got to be a good listener to be a good communicator. Get some feedback. Listen. To be a good parent, you've got to be a good listener. To talk well, you've got to listen well. That's so valuable. Get the feedback. Now, what you hear may help you change gears. Be a little stronger. Be a little softer. Find a different illustration. This one isn't working. Search for another way to say it. Become sensitive to someone else's words, not just by preparing to talk when the other person's through. Listen, pick up those signals that the feedback of words gives us. Now, here's the third way to read your audience: and emotional signals. You've got to learn to pick those up. Pick up those feelings. Women just seem to have this part built in. Men can learn it. But women have it. Woman says it doesn't feel right. Just doesn't feel right. Man says, what does that mean? It doesn't feel right. She says it's something. He says something, something. What is this something? She says I'm telling you something doesn't feel right. Now men can learn it, but women have it. Learn to read your emotion. Learn to read what others are feeling, so you can adjust your communication. So you can adjust your approach, so you can get your message across, so you can communicate well. Self preparation. Be ready for tomorrow by doing all that you can today, setting your goals. Set a goal that will make you stretch, for what it will make of you to achieve it. What a brand new reason for setting goals! What an all-encompassing challenge to have a better vision of the future, to see what it will make of you to achieve it. And here's why: the greatest value in life is not what you get; the greatest value in life is what you become. The major question to ask on the job is not what am I getting here. The major question to ask is what am I becoming here. It's not what you get that makes you valuable; it's what you become that makes you valuable. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. So there you have the two components of positive self-direction. Number one, self-knowledge, knowing who you are and what you want to do with your life, and number two, self-preparation, getting ready for the opportunities before they come your way. You need both aspects for positive self-direction. 
figuring out who you are and what you want, and being prepared for the day you reach your goals, being ready, being worthy, becoming the person you need to be in pursuit of what you want. What good is an opportunity if you're not prepared to take advantage of it? It's no good. Won't do a thing for you. Be prepared. Now here's what's called the self-knowledge acid test. Quickly, without thinking too much about it, quickly list your three most important long-term work-related goals. Is it a client you've been trying to sign for several months? Is it a major sale you've been trying to make? Is it a promotion? Is it a partnership in the firm? Quickly list your three most important long-term work-related goals. Achievements that you want to make. Achievements that will take a while to get. Write them down. Again, without thinking too much about it, quickly list your three most important personal and spiritual goals. Things that will make a difference in your personal life. What is it? What are the important goals in your personal and spiritual life? Is one of them making a conscious effort to exercise more, to eat better, to lose some weight, to get in shape? What are the three most important personal and spiritual goals that you have? Write them down. Doesn't matter what they are, just write them down. Now, take some time to really visualize what the achievement of these goals would look like. What does your future hold for you if you landed that big client? What does your future look like if you got that promotion? If you spent more time with your family? If you planned more outings with your spouse? What does your future look like? Really spend some time on this now. It's important stuff. What does it all look like? Ask yourself, is this really my goal? Is this truly what I want? Is it a positive goal? Is it important enough to me to become what it takes to reach this goal? Is it mine? Is it worth it? If your three goals on the career side and three goals on the personal side don't stand up to these questions, you need to take some time to carefully redefine a few things. Redefine your list. Redefine where it is that these goals came from. Redefine what actually is important to you. Redefine how hard you'll really work to get them. Now there are two parts to... There's two parts. Number one, don't set your goals too low. An interesting thing that we teach in leadership, don't join an easy crowd. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. Go where the pressure is on to perform, to grow. Now here's the second part on setting goals. Number one is don't set your goals too low. Number two is don't compromise. Don't sell out. There were some things I went for back in those early. If I'd known back then how much it was going to cost me, I never would have gone for them. But I didn't know. Don't sell out. The benefits are, number one, it moves you toward your goals, and number two, it refuels your ambition. Be prepared. Get ready. This method of self-preparation involves three steps. Step one, carefully consider where the next opportunity for reaching your goal will originate. Where will it come from? Will it come from networking with your colleagues? Will it come from reading the last book that you bought? The book that's still sitting on your shelf waiting to give you some answers? Will it come from you taking the time to think it out? Where will it come from? The next opportunity that will push you forward. If you don't know, here's what you have to do. For each major goal of yours, the top priorities on your list, for each of these, take out a separate piece of paper, one single sheet per major goal, write down your goal at the top and start listing all reasonable resources. Write down every possible place that you could find the opportunity to achieve this goal. 
and with each resource classify them ask yourself is this resource a sure thing a good bet about even chances unlikely a long shot ask yourself these questions and classify all of the resources you have written down that's the first step the second step in this method of self preparation is to make sure you know what you need to do to be prepared for your opportunities take your sure things first figure out what you need to do to be prepared when they happen break down your preparation into concrete steps make sure that you know exactly what you have to do to take advantage of the opportunity when it comes your way let's say that one of the top priorities on your career list of goals is to get this new client let's take it one step further to say that on your resource list for this goal is to have a lunch meeting with a friend who just happens to be the mentor of the client you're going after is this friend of yours a sure bet on your resource list well let's say he is i mean you know this guy is a tremendous consulting source for the client you want the client you want really listens to the opinions and advice of your friend so you're getting ready to have lunch with your friend what do you do you've got to make sure that you're up on all the knowledge and the industry data that will impress your friend make him realize that he knows someone who could benefit from your knowledge and your vitality and your spirit and your experience impress him impress him so much that he goes back to his friend the client you're after and tells this prospective client of yours that he needs to do business with you be prepared go through your entire list of goals and resources and classify them break each resource into concrete steps of preparation start by working on the sure bets first and then move down the line the long shots will come through every so often but start with the resources that will serve you best now get ready for the opportunities before they come your way step 3 in the self preparation method is to do all you can to make each opportunity more likely to happen after you've determined what you have to do to get ready to be prepared after you've determined this see what you can do to expedite the process what can you do to increase the likelihood of this opportunity go over it and over it and over it use these three methods again and again as you assess where you are now and where you have to go next to keep moving toward the achievements that are most important to you Step 1 consider your resources. Step 2 determine what you have to do to get ready. Step 3 expedite the opportunities. And by the way, this method of self preparation works wherever you are in your journey. Whether you're close to your goals or whether you're just starting your journey of self direction. This method works have working knowledge to draw from continually work on yourself in preparation of where you want to be build a reservoir of thoughts and ideas and philosophies and experiences that are your own build grow change get ready be prepared be prepared for a life worth living now here are the four ifs that make life worthwhile number 1 life is worthwhile if you learn Nothing worse than being stupid. Life is worthwhile if you learn. Learn from your personal experiences. Learn from other people's experiences. Second, life is worthwhile if you try. Now you've got to take what you've learned and see if you can try your hand at it. Someone says, "Well, you can't try. You have to do." No, you have to try. I put the bar up two feet and asked the kids who can jump two feet. I can some say I can't some say I don't know some say how are you going to know you don't you've just got to try just back off and run at it how are you going to know if you don't try now what if you knock the bar down does that mean you can't jump 2 feet no you have to what try it again 
Of course, you have to try. Try it another way, but try. Try your hand at it. When the record book on you is finished, let it show your wins and your losses, but don't let the record book show that you didn't try. Next, life is worthwhile if you stay. You've got to learn to stay. Now, you don't have to stay forever. Just stay till you see it through. A guy builds a foundation and then he wanders off somewhere and builds another foundation. He's got these foundations scattered all across the country. I mean, no walls, no roofs, just a bunch of foundations. Not a good reputation. Stay. You don't have to stay forever. Just stay to finish something. Don't fall into the trap of less than refined sophistication. Stay till it's over. The fourth if that makes life worthwhile, one is if you learn, two is if you try, three is if you stay, and fourth if that makes life worthwhile is if you care. Caring is a unique human experience that is so vital and so powerful and so all-encompassing and so far-reaching. If you care at all, you'll get some results. If you care enough, you can get magnificent results. To lead a life worth living, you've got to learn, you've got to try, you've got to stay, and you've got to care. Develop your positive self-direction. Do these things we've discussed. Remember the four ifs, and you're on your way to building a life worth living. Second principle of building ambition is self-reliance. Number one is self-direction. Number two is self-reliance. Taking responsibility for your own life taking responsibility for whatever happens to you, knowing that you have consciously made the decisions that are now affecting you, knowing that what is happening now, today, is the direct result of your activity, what you did yesterday. Self-reliance is basically counting on yourself. Now, being self-reliant doesn't mean you can't work with others or trust others. Self-reliance means counting on yourself, trusting yourself, being confident with yourself, being responsible to yourself, trusting your own instincts, trusting the conclusions that you have developed from your study of experiences and philosophies, taking the credit that is due you, learning from the mistakes that you have made, being self-reliant. Gestalt psychologists give an example of being self-reliant. They say that you're responsible for getting caught in the rain. They say that by deciding not to carry an umbrella every day, you have made the decision to endure an occasional drenching. Translation, by not being prepared, you make the choice of getting caught in some of life's unpleasant circumstances. Be they rain, failures, economic losses, relationship losses, professional losses, personal losses. By not being prepared, thinking ahead, it's your choice. Now here's the other side of it. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success. You increase the likelihood. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success of seizing opportunities when they come your way, of being ready within yourself to take advantage of once-in-a-lifetime situations. Some people tend to blame others for their mistakes, blame others for their failures. Somebody says, it's not my fault the report isn't done, so-and-so didn't do their part. Of course it's your fault. It's your report too. It's your responsibility to see that everyone you delegated work to does their part. Now, you can't control what others around you do, but it's in your own best self-interest, your enlightened self-interest, that you stay on top of things, especially if it's going to affect your future. You think your boss cares that John didn't do his part? You think he sees John as the bad guy? Of course not. All he sees is that the report isn't done, bottom line. Be responsible for the things that affect you. You can make sure you're more responsible by checking in with those people who are working with you, the people who make up your team. You can be more responsible by saying, hey, John, how are you doing with your part? Do you need some help? 
Can we put somebody else in here to help you finish? Now if John consistently doesn't handle his part, you've got to replace John. If he isn't doing his share, you've got to find somebody that will. Or what? It will negatively affect you. You can't wake up in the morning that the project is due hoping and wishing that John has done his part. No, you've got to be responsible because it's going to affect your career too. Now, my approach to my better future very early on in my career was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed. And I used to say something like, I sure hope things will change for the better. Then here's what I found out. They're not going to change. Somebody says, well then, how will my life ever change? Answer, when you change. When you change, when you get better, it'll get better. If you change, it'll all change. Don't put it on someone else. Hope that someone else will change it for you. Take responsibility for yourself. Take personal responsibility. You can't change the circumstances or the seasons or the wind, but you can change your reading habits. You can change whether or not you go for the skills, burn the midnight oil, turn yourself around, multiply your value by two, three, five, ten. That you've got charge of. That. Need a little pick-me-up today? 